Hey. Hey, everybody. Hello, we are live again for another storytelling live stream. And you may notice that there's one individual who's missing, who's usually here, and he will be joining us. He had some things that he needed to, to do um, before coming. So he'll be popping into this live stream a little bit later. Don't worry, Chris, Chris will be here. Um, but for now, it's uh, me, Kaylin, and, and Danny. And we're oh, so man. happy to be back for another week of storytelling and also really excited that it's Earth Day today. Mm. <laughs> and um, I know for me, and maybe you can relate, Danny, every day is Earth Day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or at least that's my vision for the world is that every day would be Earth Day. But um, it's always nice to have a, a special dedicated day where we can all come to, to celebrate the Earth and, and consider our relationships with, with the Earth more deeply. And that's what we try to do through our stories, too. So it's sort of a, a perfect time to be able to, to do this event on a, on a day where we're thinking about our relationships to the land and to the natural world. Um, so we have three new stories for you this week. And uh, as usual, we'll each tell a story and then we'll have a little bit of a, a chance to, to chat about it um, afterwards. And your comments are always welcome. So if you want to pop your where you are and just give us a little bit of a hello um, in the, the comments, we would love to see where everybody's at today, what you're doing, what the weather is like, um, where you might be in this world, because we're all in, in different places. So please feel, to, feel free to interact with us as much as you'd like, and we'll respond when we can. Um, so yeah, I think I think that's it for me. Do you have anything you want to share, Danny, before we get yep. started? Just wish everyone a happy Earth Day. We hope you enjoy the stories. Yeah. Um, all right. So Danny's going to be telling the first story. Um, so I'm going to hand it over, hand it over to you now, Danny. Thank you. <laughs> hey, everybody. Happy Earth Day from me. Um, last week, I told a story called The Tree People. Um, and in our chat as well, I mentioned that we um, we name the plants in our house, and I brought along Rose with me today, as you can see here. We gave her a little blue tack face as well. So if you're wondering who this is, this is Rose. Um, somebody asked last week if any of the stories that we tell are available to buy. So I thought that I would tell you um, a story that I wrote, which is this one called The Happiness Tree. Um, I wrote it and it was it's illustrated by a wonderful illustrator called Miriam Hull. You can have a look in here. So I'm gonna tell this story today. And if you would like a copy, I would say to contact uh, me through the Weeby Kids um, website and we can arrange to get copies out to people. So um, yeah, so this story is called The Happiness Tree. Now, last week you, may remember that in my story, I started the story by saying that the world was covered with just one type of tree. But by the end of the story, the world was, was, was covered with, with a, a range of trees. And if you do go outside and you enjoy woodlands and forests, then you will know that all trees are different. Some are very, very tall and thin, and some are very wide and bushy and, and short to the ground. Now, this story is about a willow tree, and willow trees are trees that have very, very bendy, bendy branches. But this willow tree in particular did something very, very, very special. Now, if you go to your bedroom in your window, the window in your bedroom even, or your grand or granddad's house or auntie or an uncle's house, and you look out of that window, in the far, far distance, you'll see a hill. And if on a nice sunny day, you take a walk to the top of that hill and then look off to the east, you will see another hill in the distance. And if you walk to the top of that hill and then keep walking beyond that hill as far as your little legs will carry you, and then just walk a little bit further, which most people don't do, you will arrive at a cave, a dark, damp, smelly cave. Now, this cave is very, very important. You see, a long, long time ago, somebody used to live in that cave. This somebody had a long, crooked chin with a big wart on the end and big hairs that came out 
and tickled under their arm. But this person never laughed. You see, they were very, very, very miserable. They also had a crooked nose, long gray hair that was made of cobwebs, a pointed hat, a pet cat, a cauldron, and a broomstick. Have you guessed it? That's right, this person was a witch. <laughs> now we all know that in the world there are two types of witches. There are good witches and there are bad witches. But this witch was the worst type of witch. She was very, 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 very bad. She was also very, 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 very miserable. And she was miserable because all she ever did was stay inside her cave. She didn't like going into the outdoors. She didn't like meeting, meeting people. And when she did go outside, she used to get really angry. And the one thing that made her angrier than anything else was when she saw happy, smiley, giddy, giggly people especially children. When she saw children, it used to make the wart on her nose itch furiously. And she said, one day, one day I will wipe all of those smiles off those children's faces. And back in her cave, one evening when she was eating a dinner of slugs and snails and spiders and washing it down with dirty water that dripped through the ceiling, she had an idea, a way that she could get rid of all of the happiness from the world. She grabbed her broomstick and she flew out of her cave and she went down the hill and through the fields until she came into a town. And when she came into her town, she started looking around for all kinds of terrible things that she could find. She went behind the shops and she picked up crisp wrappers and stuffed them in her bag and tin cans and, and chip wrappers and pizza boxes. And she stuffed them all in her bag. She then flew down by the river and on the top of the, the river, there was all slime from the factories and she scooped it all up and she stuffed it into her bag. And then she flew off into the parks and as she went through the parks, she noticed little bags hanging in all of the hedges and she picked them off and she shoved them in her bag. And then she set off back to her cave. But on the way back to her cave, she flew up into the sky and she collected all the smog and the smoke from the cars and the factories and she shoved it into her bag. Her bag was bulging full. She got back to her cave and she emptied all of the contents into the cauldron. She took the end of her broom. And she put the broom in the cauldron and she began to stir. And she stirred and stirred. And as she stirred, the potion became thicker and thicker. And she stirred and stirred and the potion became darker and darker. And she stirred and stirred and the potion became smellier and smellier. Until it was the thickest darkest, smelliest potion that anybody had ever seen. She then reached up onto a shelf and she grabbed two bottles. She filled one bottle with the potion and put a lid on. She filled the second bottle, put a lid on and put one under each arm, jumped back on her broomstick and whoop, sped off. Again, she went down the hill and through the town. This time she went over a forest until she came to a river and she followed the river up and up and up until it came to the mountains and there she went to the top of the very tallest mountain and from there she went on and on and on spiraling higher and higher until she got to the place in the sky where the clouds are born when she got there she took the first bottle. She took off the lid. She got the second bottle. She took off the lid. 
and she began to empty the potion into the sky. And as she emptied the potion into the sky, it created two huge black clouds. Clouds that were so big. And with a gust of wind and a clap of thunder, they clashed together. And when they clashed together, it began to rain. If you want to help with the rain here, you can. First of all, the rain was light, just like this. And then it became heavier like this. And then heavier like this. And even heavier still. Until it was the biggest rainstorm anybody had ever seen. The raindrops were the size of pine cones. They were thick and black and smelly. And they started to fall all over the world. And as they fell, something terrible happened. You see, first of all, the rain started to fall on the trees. And all the trees went from being very, very happy to being very, very, very sad. Then the rain started to fall on the flowers and the grasses. And all the flowers and the grasses went from being bright and happy to being very, very, very sweet. Then the rain started to fall on the animals, the dogs and the cats and the squirrels and the badgers and the mice and the kangaroos and the elephants and the bears. And all the animals changed from being really happy to being really, really sad. Then the rain fell on the grown-ups, the mums and the dads and the aunties and the uncles and the grands and the granddads. And they went from being really happy to being really sad. And brace yourselves, because this next part of the story is the worst part of all. You see, next, the rain began to fall on the children. And the children went from happy and smiley and giddy and giggly and playful to being very, very, very sad. Ah! <laughs> Said the witch, for her spell and her potion had worked. All of the happiness was gone from the world. And the world remained like that for the next day, the next week, the next month, the next year, and on and on and on. The world remained a very, very sad place. Some children were born in this world of sadness and they never saw a smile. Can you imagine never seeing a smile? But you'll be glad to know that one day all of that changed. You see, one day there was a young girl. She was seven and she was out on an adventure, but she was very, very sad. Everybody was sad. And she was out on an adventure into the forest and she was wandering around and she looked at all the moping trees and she started to climb the trees. And she noticed how each tree was a little bit different. Some were were smooth and some were rough. Some had really bushy leaves and some had different uh, branch structures. And then she started to look at the flowers and she noticed how some flowers were, were bright and beautiful and some were small and some felt rough and some felt smooth. And then she started to pick up rocks and she noticed how some rocks were smooth and some were angular. And after a while of exploring, she sat herself down on a tree stump. She took a deep breath. And she looked around in silence. Trying maybe just to catch a glimpse of a sad frog or a sad snail. But while she was sat there with just the sounds of the forest, something called out to her. It was another rock. But this rock seemed different to the others. And she went over to the rock. And as she went over to the rock, like 
of this. She crept over and it seemed magical. Something was calling to her. So she, she tried to turn the rock over. And as she lifted the rock over, <laughs> underneath she saw something she had never seen before. she thought she put the rock down underneath the rock she spotted a glitter worm now, i don't know if any of you have seen a glitter worm before but they are about this long and they are all the colors of the rainbow and their back is covered with what could be described as glitter all types of, of glistening colors but it wasn't the colors all the glitter which amazed the little girl, it was something else. You see, on the glitter worm's face, there was a smile. <sighs> the little girl said, but what is that on your face? It is so beautiful, I have never seen anything like it. And the glitter worm said, it is a smile. He went on, when the witch made her terrible potion and washed the happiness away, I hid here under this rock and I've been waiting for somebody like you to come and find me. And the little girl said, but it is so beautiful. Is there a way that I can get a smile too? And the glitter worm said, yes, for I know where all of the happiness is. And the glitter worm led the little girl through the forest until they came to the base of a big tree. And the glitter worm looked up at the tree and said, this tree, this is the happiness tree. When the witch made the potion and washed the happiness away, this tree soaked it up in its roots and it holds the happiness in its branches. The little girl said, yes, but how do I get a smile? And the glitter worm went off and it climbed the tree. And from up in the tree, it nibbled a branch and the branch fell to the ground. And the glitter worm said to the little girl, pick up the branch. So she did. And he said, begin to gently soften the branch. He said, make it into a, a smile. He said, but don't stop there, make it into a hoop. So she did, she made it into a hoop. And the glitter worm explained, he said, a hoop about the size of your head. So she did. He then said, put your hand through the hoop and grab the thin end and pull it back through. And then begin to weave in and out, and in, and out, and in, and out, until all of the end is wet. So then take the thick end and do the same. And the little girl did this, but she wasn't sure why. But she trusted the glitter worm. And in the end, she had a hoop like this. And the glitter worm said, now put it on your head, for what you are holding is a happiness crown. And whoever wears a happiness crown from the happiness tree will regain their smiles. So the little girl took hold of the crown. And she popped it on her head. Wow. And as she did, the whole world changed. All the muscles in her face changed and a big smile appeared. But it wasn't just her face that changed. You see, her heart opened up like a huge butterfly. She said, I feel incredible. The glitter worm said, yes, for that is the feeling of happiness. She said, but I want all my friends and my family to feel like this too. And the glitter worm said, bring them, bring all your friends and all of your family to the happiness tree and together make crowns. And by one crown at a time, happiness will spread around the world again.
and people came from far and wide and they made happiness crowns just like this one. And one person at a time, happiness spread. Now, I've said before that I think all good stories have a meaning to them. And I've been telling this story for a long time. And I often say to people, so what is the meaning of the happiness tree? And a lot of people started saying to me, the meaning of the happiness tree is to always be happy. But when I wrote that story, the meaning that I had for the story was different. You see, for me, the meaning of the happiness tree is that some days we are happy and some days we are really sad. And being both happy and being sad is okay. But what's really important is that when you are feeling sad, you know how to make your way back to happiness. And the little girl in the, in the story, she did exactly what I do to get myself back to happiness if I'm feeling sad. She went out on an adventure into the woods and she explored everything and she picked things up. And she also had a little sit spot moment where she sat quietly. So that's what I do if I'm feeling sad and I want to get happy. Maybe you do the same. Maybe you do something different. But I'd say give it a try because adventures in the forest always cheer me up. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Danny. And welcome, <laughs> Chris. <laughs> nice to <laughs> we, see you. We told everybody Hiya. that you'd be joining us in a little bit. So they were expecting cool. you and glad that you're here with us now. Yeah, you made it. Oh, yeah. That was so lovely. I, I, you know, having read the book, I have never seen you tell it. And that's <gasps> completely different. And yes. um, oh, it's just so lovely to be in there with you yeah, whilst you were yeah. telling that story. Oh, it's beautiful. Thank you. It is. As a storyteller, you can never put your story into a book fully, wholly, can mm. you? Because there's no. so much more than, than what you can get in the pages or in the pictures. Yeah. So, yeah. I loved your your props and um and the witch when the witch cackled across the screen. <laughs> I, loved that. I have so many props for that story. They, they were just a few, so and they all seem to work well. Even this huge stone that I logged in mm. from outside. So yeah, yeah. There we go. There we are. Yeah, the stone reminded me of how uh, really amazing things are hidden underneath stones like we walk past stones all the time and how often do we stop and think i wonder what's under there and uh yeah it just made me think like i want to maybe check under more stones now <laughs> and see if i can find a yeah. was it a glitter worm the glitter worm yeah yes the glitter worm although yeah there's, there must be one in my sitting room at the moment sort of hanging over by the uh by the uh, by the window it's glittering lots of light oh, yeah yes yeah. <laughs> I love that every week. Yeah, it's great. Super. Oh, yeah, the, the treasures underneath the, underneath stones, and um, I can remember once um, climbing underneath a building. Actually, the, uh, this was in um, Malaysia, and because we had kicked a football underneath this building that we were sort of playing nearby, and uh, and I was just being so petrified about going underneath this thing. It was my job to, or my turn to go and get the, the football. But when I got close to the football, there was this, um, it looked like a scorpion just sort of coming up closer and closer. And it was like, oh my God, that's so cool. And then I got the football and ran away again. But, yeah. um, <laughs> um, you know, just those sort of the treasures of the thing that you can find underneath stuff when you're looking. Yeah, um, it's it's amazing. It's just mm -hmm. the best thing to do is to spend time uh, looking for stuff yeah. underneath. It's like those hidden. adventures in hidden places, and I think yeah. certainly with me anyway, with with us, a lot of us being restricted to our our gardens at the moment, you can really get to know your garden by just paying more attention to it and looking at these little like micro habitats that are, that are all happening. Whether it's underneath the the, the plants where there's loads of spiders scurrying around or under rocks. Mm. Last week in our garden, or maybe the week before, we made a micro pond. It's, only, it's about this big. It's from a, a, an old water carrier that we had. And just watching that and seeing the sparrows coming down and bathing in it has been great. So mm -hmm. even though we feel that we are 
like enclosed at the moment and we can't go out much i think it helps us look a little bit closer at the things that we we have mm. yeah. yeah and also maybe appreciate the time that we that we maybe took for granted that we could mm. be outside before maybe we can come to it with more more gratitude gratitude and appreciation you know you don't know what you got till it's gone <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, I've got to talk more about little things. But um, uh, bugs and beetles. I, in England, we have these little things called I call them mint beetles. Anyway, and they, they uh, right now they are sort of gathering on tops of dock leaves, and um, then they are mating. And then underneath the leaves, if you turn them over, you'll find loads of tiny little yellow uh, eggs that they've laid under there. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, that's well, that's definitely something that you can find quite regularly or kind of commonly is mm. dock leaves, and they're worth, mm. especially ones that look like they've been chewed a little bit. Then uh, go check them out, see if you can find any of those yellow eggs underneath. Yeah, awesome. great. Well, should we uh, head into the next story? Yeah, let's do that. I feel again like we have similar themes, Danny. We did this last week too <laughs> without yeah. planning it. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. like a little yeah. similar. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to tell my story story next. So if we're ready, I'll. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sit Good back and enjoy. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Good. All right. So. This is a story that I wrote. Um, if you've been following these live streams for a little bit, I tend to tell stories that I make up myself, mostly because I find them less intimidating <laughs> than trying to tell another story. Um, so this was one I was thinking this week, what story could I tell? And I went for a walk um, on Monday uh, through the forest that's not too far from my home that I am able to access and was wondering what story can I tell? And it was a day where it felt like it was hung between the balance of the transition from winter to you know eventual summer and this spring feeling where the buds were starting to come out on the trees and I could see the potential for flowers that were coming from uh, forming on the, the plants on the ground, but the ground was still frozen um, and there was still ice on the water uh, and it's still like the, the clutches of winter were still there, like winter was still grasping and holding on. And, uh, and then we've just been experiencing the flip-flop between warm weather where it feels lovely to be outside and then snow. <laughs> We're still getting some snow. Yesterday it snowed here um, in Ottawa where I live. So this story came from the inspiration of that, that spring and how it can really kind of flip-flop you back and forth between um, winter and the hopes for, for summer and warmth. <clears throat> So this is a brand new story that I'm excited to share with you all and um, we'll see how it goes. So the way the story starts is back in the day, a long, long time ago, there used to be only two seasons. Not like today where we have four. There were only two. There was winter and there was summer. And all of the people and the animals and the plants, um, everyone much preferred summer. They just felt more comfortable. The sun was out and shining, it just felt more pleasant and warm um, to, to be outdoors in the, in the summer. And so they would often throw big celebrations when summer would return, when the flip from winter to summer would happen. Everyone would put on a big celebration and they would want to have a big party to celebrate summer and they'd want lots of decorations. And so the flower spirits would go around and be putting flowers of all different colors all over the land. And the, the tree spirits would go to all the, the trees and would burst the branches with bright green leaves. And then the animal spirit would go and invite all of the animals to, to celebrate by singing. And they would create a chorus of sound, beautiful sound. The birds would be singing together in the trees and the bushes. Um, and the, the frogs, like the peepers in the ponds and the, the streams would, would also make their noises. And so there was bursts of color and green and these beautiful sounds of animals singing. And that would be the, the celebration for, for summer. And there was one year where everyone was getting prepared for this celebration and the flower spirit was out putting out all the flowers and the trees were getting the, the, the tree spirits were putting the leaves out and the animals were singing. And as they were doing this, they were talking to each other about how 
they really just didn't like the winter and that this past winter had been particularly horrible and long and just so bitter and cold and that they were so glad that winter was over and so glad that summer was here. Um, and just really saying negative things about winter. And winter overheard what everybody was saying and could hear they were saying these awful things about them. And winter never really thought that people didn't like them. They knew that they spent more time outside in the summer, but they never really thought that the, the community didn't like them. And it started to make winter feel really, really sad, uh, feeling like nobody wanted to be friends with winter or, or, or even want winter to, to be a thing, to exist. And so winter started to cry, started to cry really sad tears. And as winter started to cry, the tears turned into ice and turned into snow and started to spread all over the land and cover the flowers and freeze the, the leaves that the tree spirits had made and turn them into like glass. And some of them were even shattering and falling to the ground. And as winter continued to cry, the whole land was blanketed in white snow and ice. And it felt like winter had returned. And winter took themselves off in their sadness to the north, to the cave where they often spend their time and just sat in the cave crying and the snow and the ice and the, everything continued over the land. And all of the, the people and the animals and the trees were really confused. They had been expecting it to be summer and we're starting this celebration and everything had turned back into winter. This wasn't supposed to happen. And so they gathered together and said, what, does anyone know what's going on? Why has winter returned? This has never happened before. What do we do? We can't have continuous winter. We can't survive if that's how things are. And so they started to talk with each other about what they could do. And said, somebody's going to have to go talk to winter to see what's going on and why they've come back when it should be summer. And they decided to ask one of the, the special people uh, people in the community was a little girl named Harmony. And she'd been given that name because she was really good at helping to resolve conflicts between different individuals. If there was ever an argument, Harmony was really good at talking to people um, and understanding and helping them to resolve. And so they called over Harmony and said, is this something you think you can help with? Can you go talk to Winter? So Harmony nodded and said, yeah, I'll do my best what I can do. And so Harmony headed off on a journey to the north to go to Winter's cave and entered the, the cave very slowly because Harmony could hear the sounds of Winter sobbing, sobbing and sobbing at the back of the cave. So Harmony gently walked in and said, Winter, Winter, are you there? And Winter looked up from the tears and saw Harmony there and said, yes, I'm here. <laughs> And Harmony said, what's wrong? I see you're crying and your tears are turning into snow and ice and the land has turned back into winter when we were just about to celebrate summer. And winter through her sobs said, but I heard all of the terrible things you were saying about me and it makes me feel awful and that you don't appreciate all the things that I try to give to you all. As winter, I know it's you don't get to spend as much time outside or the, the sun isn't strong and, and warm, but I give you time to rest. Winter is a time where I, my gift is to allow everybody to have a chance to, to sleep and to rest. Because if you had the energy that you spend throughout the summer all year round, you wouldn't make it. You need time to rest. And that's what I tried to give you. And I also refill your lakes and your ponds and your streams with water because my snow collects and then it's there for you when it melts for the summer. And there are some things that won't grow without being frozen first. And so I carefully hold them in my ice and snow so that they can emerge and, and grow in the summertime. And these are gifts that I try to give to you all, but you don't seem to want them and that makes me sad. And Harmony realized that they hadn't been appreciating winter for all the gifts that winter had provided and that they would celebrate summer every year, but basically ignore winter. And so Harmony said, winter, I totally understand why you're sad. Let me see if I can try to, to resolve this. Let me go talk to everyone. 
And so Harmony went back to the rest of the community to, to see if she could get everybody to, to work together to figure out what to do, because Harmony had an idea. So Harmony went to first the, the flower spirits and said, flower spirits, I know you have this power to create these beautiful flowers all over the land for our celebration when we, when we celebrate the coming of summer, but we need to create a celebration for winter too. Is there something that you could create other than flowers as a way to decorate for a celebration? And the flower spirits kind of shook their heads and said, no, I don't know what we could do. What we do is create flowers. I'm not sure if there's another thing we could, we could offer. And Harmony said, could you at least try, see what your, your powers can create? So the flower spirits looked around and they saw a blossom that was still hanging on. It was frozen, but it was on the end of a branch of um, an apple tree. So they focused on the blossom and they put their powers into it. And after a few moments, the flower turned into a bright red fruit, beautiful red apple. And so they grasped the apple down and they said, maybe this is something, this is something different that we could offer as a celebration for winter. And Harmony said, that's great. That's a great start. Let's take that and let's go see the tree spirits. And so they wandered off and found the tree spirits and explained what was happening. They said, winter is really, really upset and sad and we need to find a way to celebrate. So is there something that you could provide for our celebration? I know that you turn all the leaves to a beautiful green for summer. Is there something else you could do? The tree spirits again, you know, shook their heads saying, but that's what we do. What, what else could we possibly offer at this time? But they decided to give it a shot and try. And so they looked at a maple tree that had a maple leaf that was dangling on the end, kind of half frozen, about to fall off. And they focused on it, put their powers into it. And the leaf turned into a beautiful, bright orange color. And other leaves that were around started to turn yellows and golds and reds. And they thought, okay, well, that's beautiful. That's something different. We'll take that with us and see if that's something that can celebrate winter. So they again started to set off to go speak to the animal spirits. And they said the same story to the animal spirits. We need to find a way to celebrate winter. I know that you get all the animals to sing when it's time to celebrate summer. Is there something else you could do for winter? And the animal spirit thought about, hmm, okay. Well, singing is what we do best. I don't know if there's another thing that we could do to celebrate. But then all of a sudden thought, oh, I have an idea. So the animal spirits called over the starlings, the birds that were these beautiful spotted, multicolored, shining in the sun birds and said, instead of singing, can you dance for us? And the starlings all looked at each other and said, we'll give it a try. And they flew up into the sky and they started to form these formations synchronized in the sky called murmurations. And everybody gazed at how beautiful this was and how amazing it looked and thought that is perfect. Let's take all of these things that we've created and go see winter. So they all traveled to the north, to the cave, and Harmony went inside and said, Winter, we have something really special we want to share with you. We think you're going to like it. Would you come out of the cave? And Winter, still through the tears, <laughs> came out of the cave saying, what, what could you possibly have for me? You all hate me. And they said, just wait there. And Harmony called over the flower spirits and said, can you show what you've got for Winter? And they held out the bright red fruit of the apple that they had created. And Winter had never seen anything like that before. And said, that's, that's beautiful. That's so amazing. Wow. And the tree spirits came over and said, look at these leaves. And they were all different colored leaves, not just the greens, but the, the reds and the yellows and the golds. And Winter thought, that's really beautiful and gorgeous. And then they said, wait for it. And the animal spirits called over the starlings and Winter watched as the starlings did their dancing formation throughout the sky. And Winter's tears disappeared and the ice and the snow started to melt and the green started to come back and the flowers started to emerge again from the ground. And summer was able to come back. And the community all decided that to remember that year and what had happened and to remember to appreciate both the summer and the winter, they would create two celebrations each year. And one celebration would be when winter would transition to summer 
they would create a, a festival that would take some time where they would get to celebrate the transition where some days would feel more like winter and some days would feel more like summer, but the flowers would come out eventually and the green of the, the leaves and the singing of the birds and the frogs. But they would also save a celebration for when summer transitioned to winter, they would bring out the fruits on the trees, the flowers would turn into these fruits and the leaves would start to turn from their greens to the reds and the yellows and the golds and the oranges. And the birds would come out to dance and do their murmurations throughout the sky. And so that was how they decided to create a way to remember that there has to be a balance between the things that might feel hard and the things that feel good and that they both bring good things to us. And um, we need both winter and summer. And now to celebrate that, we also have spring and the autumn. So that's my new story. Awesome. <laughs> nice job. <laughs> I love that. Oh, you're you. brilliant, actually. I love the stories you're making. They're <laughs> really amazing. And not only that, the um, the emotion that you're bringing with them. Um, yeah, it's great. Thank you. I love it. My tears weren't quite as good as Danny's crying. <laughs> <laughs> I've had oh, a rough week. Maybe not. <laughs> 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 I love the idea that autumn and spring are celebrations for winter mm. and, and, and summer. It's a beautiful thought. It also made yeah. me think as well about if I had any mm. stories like that as a child, because one thing that I recognize now more as an adult, probably because I work in the outdoors, is that it's you can't miss the changing of the seasons. We have all these little triggers that we notice and we realize when we're moving from summer into the autumn. But as a child, I don't remember that. I just remember I just remember it either being sunny or cold. And I don't know if that's because, um, well, I, I guess it's the idea of I had season blindness. I guess I didn't recognize those signs. But a story like yours actually helps people helps children recognize you know what are we looking out for in the celebration of of winter or what are we looking out for in the celebration of summer so i love that i really i really enjoyed that as a way of just bringing that mindfulness to the changes in the seasons mm. yeah nice definitely I love them at bringing in the murmurations as a celebration yeah. of winter oh, too. Yeah. That's one of my most favourite things to see. And, uh, you know, I've just seen it as the birds doing their thing. But yeah. actually, if they're, it's like seeing that murmuration as a celebration of yeah. of winter gives it uh, an extra magic. So yeah. for me, that's a lovely little blessing mm -hmm. from that story as well. I love like you could use it all year round as well, that story as mm -hmm. you know, looking for signs of spring and looking for signs of, of winter and signs of, of the fall. Um, it, it could be a story which to the same group, you, you know, tell it four times across the year with a different little seeking and searching activity to go, to go mm -hmm. with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why mm -hmm. I kind of thought it was a good one for Earth Day to sort mm -hmm. of celebrate more, you know, bigger, bigger picture of the, the land that we, yeah. where we live. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, which is actually funny for me to reflect on because I grew up in Hawaii <laughs> where we didn't have the four seasons. <laughs> mm. oh. So it's um, thinking about, yeah, how you said, Danny, when you were a kid and trying to remember, like not, not necessarily picking up on those things. I also mm. often think of, of my childhood and being like, well, there was times where it rained and there was times where there was less rain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So you had volcanoes uh, were your season, I suppose. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's clouds. Oh. <laughs> clouds of smoke. Yeah. Wow. Um, I saw a comment coming through there about somebody celebrating the winter solstice as a yeah. way of celebrating winter. Winter. Mm. Yeah, which is a lovely thing to do. Yeah. Um, we recently started doing a log burning ceremony on the solstice, which we've tried to do as a family, as a tradition, which is which has been nice as well, just to kind of honor the winter mm -hmm. a little bit. So, yeah. yeah. 
something yeah. I really enjoy doing actually you know, the celebrating mm -hmm. the seasons I'm really grateful that okay. in this country we have we still have our sort of traditional holidays of you know May Day is coming up soon yeah. uh, sort of celebration of spring and then all of these different you know going through the seasons we have mm -hmm. we have these festivals that we can use to to celebrate yeah, yeah. that's the turning yeah. of the seasons let's do it mm -hmm. but yeah we've got a, a got a day to celebrate the earth as well yeah, yeah. Yeah, and maybe just through the the story and the message of the story, thinking about well, how is the earth celebrating too? Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> how can That's we do it? Thought. Partnership. Yeah. Mm. What do you think to um, this COVID nineteen bringing us into a little bit more balance? Then, you know, in terms of the story and that there being balance, and mm -hmm. I think humans have been doing a little bit too much doing mm -hmm. recently and uh, the lockdown has been a little bit like an imposed winter sort of um, mm -hmm. and yeah hopefully that's well I would really like it if humans could take that forward and be a little bit yeah. do a little bit more being rather than so much doing because I think the yeah. doing does brings a lot of the damage doesn't it if it is all summer all the time yeah. we don't get a chance to rest and yeah. recuperate and I've really enjoyed that rest that we've had yeah, it, yeah. Also, the doing just creates more doing as well. Mm. So it's an easy spiral to get ourselves into. So this has been a lovely break and a chance to be human beings for a while instead of human doings. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. So, yeah, it's been good. Yeah. yeah. Cool. It's funny when you said May Day, then Chris. My uh, my first thought was, I wonder if we'll be able to go out. On May Day, or if we'll have to stay in, or maybe we'll have to do some maypole dancing in the garden. Yeah, so maybe we need to do a live stream. <laughs> yeah, we could do a live stream maypole. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It'd be nice uh, to celebrate where we are. Just yeah, of course. Somehow. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, are you ready for your story, Chris? Yep, I am ready for my story. Okay, the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you so much. So the story that I'd like to tell you today comes from a guy called Terry Jones. So some of you may know Terry Jones of uh, the Monty Python crew. And uh, I believe that um, he was um, Brian's mum in The Life of Brian. But he was not only was he a, an actor, he wrote some fantastic fairy tales and sort of modern tales. And sadly, Terry died this year, uh, in January 21st. And um, but he's left behind him a lot of laughter and um, yeah, some wonderful stories. So when I was putting together my storytelling for outdoor learning course, uh, I contacted him to see if I could retell this story as part of that um, year-long course. And it's yeah, it's one of the stories that features in that course. Um, I first heard it told by a guy called Chris Salisbury, who I used to work with, and a company called Wildwise doing outdoor camps. Um, so this is one of the stories that Chris Salisbury told around the campfire. And I loved it, loved its message. And so I'd like to share it with you today, because it's an Earth Day story. Um, here we go. Way back when this country was full of lots of little kingdoms, there was a king and a queen who lived in a kingdom. And they lived somewhere in the deep, deep, dark woods. Well, not in the woods, but in a castle. And in the castle, which was surrounded by deep, dark woods. Well, in the castle lived many happy people. And in fact, everybody in that kingdom was incredibly well. They were all happy and healthy. It was because in the castle there was the glass cupboard. And this is the title of the story, The Glass Cupboard. What was special about this glass cupboard? Well, the thing that was special about it was that it was glass and you could see into it. And most of the time there was nothing in there. But when you needed something, something or somebody in the uh, kingdom needed something, 
say uh, it was a new book of folk tales, for example. Well, all you needed to do was ask the cupboard, please, can we have a new book of folk tales that we need to tell to our children? And ping, into the cupboard would appear a book of folk tales. This one happens to be Animal Folk Tales of Britain and Ireland by Sharon Jacksties. Very nice book. Um, but the, that was marvellous. So you could take the book out and you could read it. Um, but the thing is, you always had to put something back in. So maybe you'd finished with your flask of tea and you didn't need it anymore. So you'd put that back into the cupboard and poof, it would disappear. So everyone in the kingdom had everything that they needed. The king and queen, well, they could sit back and relax and they didn't have to do much ruling because people were happy and they were healthy and they were just going on about their, their business. You know, the bread maker was making bread and the soldiers were soldiering and the gardeners were gardening and, you know, the people who looked after the orchards looked after the orchards and the shepherds were shepherding and everybody was just content with what they were doing. And the king, well, he wasn't a wealthy man. He didn't keep all the wealth for himself. He made sure that if people needed stuff, he got what they had. So his, they were talking one day, the king and the queen, and the king said, you know, it would be really nice to have a little holiday, wouldn't it? We could just go away somewhere, go and explore, go on an adventure. We've been ruling for so long. Wouldn't you think that would be a nice idea, dear? He said, oh, that would be lovely. Oh, well, where should we go? Oh, I would love to go to the seaside. I haven't been to the seaside. Right, said the king. Well, let's get some uh, some you know, some keys for um, a hotel. But, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go to a hotel at the seaside and uh, we'll um, we'll go on the train and, uh, yeah, we'll spend, spend a week there. Right, so the king went to the glass cupboard and he asked the cupboard for everything you might need for a holiday at the beach. So, ping! into the cupboard. Well, what would you have on your holiday? Well, often people say things like, well, we need to have some sun cream and a spade to go onto the beach. And, oh, you might need to take your surfboard and your, your swimmers and a towel, of course, and, well, you know, things like that. Well, the king and the queen, they had what they needed. They put it in their leather suitcases and they took them down into the stables and uh, they got a couple of horses and they got a little um, cart or carriage and they set off on their holiday. The guards and the soldiers were to look after the castle until they got back. And the king and queen happily set off on their holidays. As they were going through the woods, who should be looking but three robbers? Well, I don't mean to cause any offence to anybody who lives in London. You were gone, not going to cause any stereotypes here, but it seems to me that whenever I do a robber's voice, it ends up being that sort of, well, East England sort of thing. Well, anyway, the robbers were watching, and they saw that the cart was wandering slowly through the woods, and there were a couple of horses pulling this, well, this carriage, and inside the carriage... Oh, Oh, that was the king and the queen. And where were they going? They were oh, they were going on a holiday. Right, said the chief robber. Now's our chance. Tonight, we must sneak into the castle and go and get the glass cupboard. Then we can have anything we want. Fantastic, said the other robbers. Let's do it. So they got all painted up with their dark, dark, sort of, they got charcoal on their faces, they put their dark clothes on, and they set off towards the castle. Well, they got there, there was a bit of a party going on, and they waited until all the guards were asleep. And the, thankfully, someone, some silly old person had left the drawbridge down. So the guards, they just wandered straight in, and they tiptoed over the sleeping guards and they made sure that the, they brought the little bits and bobs to feed the dogs to make sure that they wouldn't make too much noise and they set off up inside the castle to the room where the glass cupboard was put a big blanket over the top of the glass cupboard and carefully carried it down the stairs and over the sleeping people out of the courtyard and off across the drawbridge and away into the forest. 
And when they got back to their hideout, fantastic, into the middle of the clearing where they lived, they put the glass cupboard on a big old tree stump that was normally their flat table. And there the chief Robbie said, oh, oh if you're waiting for this, oh, I would love, I would love to just have just one bag of diamonds, just, just one. And ping, into the cupboard appeared a bag of diamonds. So he reached in and he put, picked it out and he looked in at all these diamonds sparkling there. Oh, fantastic. Well, the next one, he said, oh, I want to have a bag of diamonds as well. So ping, into the cupboard appeared another bag of diamonds. The third robber, he was like, why can't I have some as well? I'll have a bag of diamonds. Bing into the cupboard appeared a bag of diamonds and the chief probably he said well do you know what i've always wanted to have a gold teapot <laughs> you know that's what I, bizarrely i would like to have a gold teapot please and into the cupboard ping appeared a golden teapot so he reached in and he picked it out and he stroked it and it oh, wasn't it nice and the other rod was like oh that's a good idea i think i should have one of them as well Ping, appeared a golden teapot. And the third one, he was like, oh, I think I'll have one of them too, please. Ping, appeared a golden teapot. Well, they kept on going round and round. Each time, the first robber, he said, well, you know, silver candlesticks. I think I'll have a Ferrari. Oh, maybe I'll, I'll have a lot. I'll have a big house, actually. That'd be rather nice. I'll have a big mansion, you know, lots of bedrooms, golden bath. Oh, I may, maybe I, I fancy some, some diamond-encrusted trainers. <laughs> <laughs> what about that? I'll have some of them too. Brilliant. All these things appeared in the cupboard. But eventually, well, you know, they started to get hungry and things. They didn't think to just get a sandwich from the cupboard or maybe a cup of tea. It was just they wanted more and more and more things. And by, by sunrise, there'd be great big piles of loot behind them. And well, the chief robber, he was getting a bit sick and tired of these other guys having just as much as he was. He was like, well, I'm the chief. I should be getting more than everyone else, surely. He thought, well, the only thing I can do is I can smash this cupboard. That'll stop them from having any more than I do. So he reached down and he picked up a silver candlestick and he thought, well, the last thing that I could do is that I really need is a bag of rubies. So he asked for a bag of rubies. Ping, appeared into the cupboard. He opened the door, he reached in, he took out the bag of rubies and he smashed the cupboard. We take a little break at this point because the king and queen were having a fantastic time on their holiday. They stayed in the nice little hotel at Sidmouth and there they went out and walked along the promenade and they they had, came home and they had you know, nice, simple food from the restaurants. And when they were finished, they thought, oh, it's time to go home. Let's get in the carriage. And they set off home. <laughs> and when they got home, there were a few sheepish guards and just giving the five minute warning to my son who's looking in and saying, oh, is it, can I come in yet? So, um, so yeah, the, the guards, they, uh, they looked a bit sheepish as the king, king came in and the king and queen said, oh, is everything all, all right? Well, what's up? Um, terribly sorry, sir, but uh, someone uh, has stolen the glass cupboard. It's gone, you can't find it anywhere. Oh, said the king. He looked across at his wife and he said, well, oh, that, that's, that's quite unfortunate. Um, have you been to look for it? Well, we've looked around the castle everywhere. We can't find it anywhere. Well, what about round the kingdom? Have you gone off to look round the kingdom? Somebody must have. It's got to be somewhere. Oh, oh that's a good idea. So I'll, I'll go and get the horses. And off they went. The guards and the soldiers, they went off round the country and they looked here and there. And eventually one of the soldiers came to a place in the woods and there on a big tree stump were loads of broken pieces of glass there were three dead 
robbers. Three big piles of stuff, loot, gold coins. There was all kinds of stuff, golden teapots, bags of diamonds. I think I know what happened here. So he got on his horse and he went back to the castle as quickly as he could. When he got back to the castle, he told the king what he'd found. And the king said, hmm. What I need you to do is to take a cart and a good horse, bring back all the loot and share it with everybody in the country. But I want all those pieces of glass. Put them in a big box and bring them to me. And so that was what was done. Everything was brought back. It was shared out equally amongst everyone. But the king took the bar, box with the glass down to the glasssmith. Now the glasssmith, well, he was very red in the face and he had, well, no hair on his arms at all. But he was a very creative man. And he could do anything with glass. And the king asked him to turn all those pieces of glass from the glass cupboard into this amazing globe. He wanted a globe, well, quite big, maybe like this. Or no, maybe a bit bigger, probably like that. That's probably about right. Maybe about the same size as that exercise ball over my shoulder over there. And, but not just any old globe. What the king wanted was coloured pieces of glass put onto the outside of the globe to be like the shape, the countries, the shapes of all the countries in the whole world. All the islands, all the continents, there in glass on this enormous globe. And when it was finished, the king took that beautiful glass globe carefully because it was delicate. And he brought it into the market square where he had, had built a stone plinth in the middle of the marketplace. And carefully he placed the globe into its resting place on the top of the plinth. And he gathered everybody, as many people as he could, from around the kingdom. And he gathered them in to the marketplace for a special ceremony to reveal what was underneath this big piece of cloth that was covering the globe. <clears throat> and when everyone was there, he whoosh, whisked back the big blanket. And there, underneath, was this beautiful glass globe. And everybody went, ooh, and they awed. And they marveled at this beautiful thing that the glassmaker had made. And the king said, as you know, everyone, the glass cupboard was stolen. We no longer have that th magical thing that we can just take what we need from this glass cupboard. And so I have created this beautiful glass globe to, he to be here in the marketplace to remind us all that the earth is a fragile place and that no matter what we take out of it, we should always remember that we need to put something back in. And that is the end of that story. So thank you very much for listening and thank you very much Terry Jones for that wonderful story. Hmm. Thanks, Chris. Chris. There you go. Oh, thank you. Yeah, what a lovely blessing that is, I think, for Earth Day. So, so I had to tell it and I managed to get out of having to make up a story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, that's a great story. I haven't heard that one before. Haven't you? Oh, mm -hmm. cool. Oh, good. Good, good, good. I was yeah. laughing out loud at some points. It just, it, I don't know if it was the way you told it or you seemed like you were having so much fun. Yeah. yeah. It. There was one bit when you kind of disappeared off the side of the screen and I was just <laughs> I was really, really chuckling. I was actually having so much fun that I was forgetting about the 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 line of the story and trying to link the meaning of it. And I was like, come on, stop laughing so much. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, that was great fun. I really enjoyed that. Cool.
Yeah, yeah good. I, I think, uh, I don't know if you saw the, the conversation that I had with David Heathfield. Um, he's another storyteller and uh, he has, he works with a project called the Hands Up Project, which um, I won't, won't go into, but and um, one of the things that they do is do quite a lot of online storytelling um, of stories from around the world. And he was telling me how he's just learning to use the, the camera on the on the computer a little bit more and so um he said you know he brings up things you know really up close and then he'll often move around in the room behind him so he doesn't always have these things on him and i just thought ah oh, yes as i was doing that thing about them going off on their holiday i just thought mm. oh yeah i'll just carry on off mm. the screen <laughs> and i was enjoying myself yeah just kind of playing with yeah. you yeah, can like tell you a great time yeah <laughs> storytelling techniques adapting to our yeah. new format yeah, yeah definitely <laughs> disappear off stage yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah and i think i know this is a, a chance to have a bit of a plug but you know that storytelling for outdoor learning year course is is a load of myths and fables from around the world which are um i think they're gifts to people because they help us reframe the way that we see the world and um uh yeah because i think we've we've been doing a lot of living out of these myths which are sort of kind of judeo-christian and there are many other ways of looking at the world and that's what some of these stories that we're, we've been telling over the last few weeks um contain some of that magic of you know let's look at the world slightly differently um yeah, and that's what the storytelling for outdoor learning year course does hopefully go through a whole bunch of stories and helps people sort of play with new storytelling techniques and find their own storyteller. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's lovely. That's a great resource for people to mm -hmm. have. And I know I, I was even having a little conversation in the comments about the, uh, well, for me, I've told this before of like storytelling, I never thought I could do it. <laughs> I never thought I could do it. And uh, yeah, and just tried it. And like I've, I've said multiple times, started writing my own stories because I find that less, less intimidating. And now I can't stop, I love it. I absolutely love it. And mm -hmm. I know there, we all tell stories in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, we all have different, like you don't have to be a certain type of storyteller. And so I love what you just said, Chris, about finding your own mm -hmm. storyteller inside of yourself um, and your own unique way of sharing um, these ways of looking at the world because that's what stories are, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We are we're all storytellers it's just the types of stories that we tell like we 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 as humans that's what we do we come home from work and we tell people what we've been up to or you meet somebody yeah. and you tell them so we're, we're forever telling stories it's a part it's just a part of us just like nature is a, is a part of us and the air is a part of us stories mm. are a part of us too yeah it's just how how do we channel them you know and how do we the or what do we get inspired by to become our story? Like your, the story behind your story, Kaylin, of just going out walking in the woods and mm. being open to what nature has to to offer in in her stories. Then, yeah, that's that's your channel. It's a little bit like I said last week. She, nature has a story for you. And you become the vessel, mm. you know? and it's it's a, a nice reminder as well of how we how we open ourselves to different influences because there's stories coming at us all the time from all yeah. different places so it's like where do we put the filter on and what do we open up to and then what do we share so mm. we're all storytellers i saw a little message coming in then um saying that whilst they're away i think it's forest forever green forest school they're going to practice and practice so yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe they want to come on and do a, a story on here. Yeah, yeah. the best well, the, type of learning to come and be yeah, vulnerable a, and have a go. Exactly, open invitation. If you want to have your inner storyteller <laughs> come yeah. out in a live stream format, um, mm. even if you don't feel like you're experienced, please reach out to us because um, definitely want to open up this platform for other people to to share stories. Um, and I, I just am reading a comment too of someone who mentioned the book Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer mm. um, and the message of mm. giving something back to the earth and the difference between a market culture and a gift culture. And that was something that came to mind actually just to go back to Chris's story really quickly of the um, how the message was to to give back, like not just think about what you can take, but what you can give 
give back. And reading Sweetgrass definitely introduces that concept of, um, yeah, the reciprocity piece. It's not just about mm -hmm. what we can take, it's how we can give back. And something that I've been really focusing on is what can I give first? So instead of the kind of, we have this mentality of, um, I want something, so I'm gonna take and then I'll give you whatever for it. But instead yeah. thinking, what can I give as a gift first and then mm -hmm. receive back? Yeah. So, really lovely so, some thoughts. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, with you on that one. Uh, I was like a moment to share a little, a very short song actually um, for Earth Day, partly because I, ended up singing it this morning and making a little post um but because spring is so much about foraging for me and going out and um finding all this amazing bounty that the earth is just kind of popping up all over the place um and i don't know how many years ago it was it was probably 15 years ago i reckon that this little song popped into my brain um to give thanks to the plants and you know going in on that uh, braiding sweet grass comment that uh, everybody, you know, everybody can give thanks in their own way. And um, here's one that is a little song that I sing, which goes, um, when you hear this song and I'm picking your leaves, I'm giving thanks to you for the gifts you bring. And I just sing that over and over myself in my head or out loud uh, to the plants when I'm picking. Because, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, I, I can't necessarily give what else can I necessarily give back other than you know something like that? You know, sometimes it's difficult to give actually give something, um, mm. but a song or a, a thought or a you know, a smile mm -hmm. from your previous story or a, you know a little celebration yeah. are other ways of giving back, aren't they? Mm. I was having a similar conversation with my daughter this week because we were picking and eating, and um, we were talking about the idea where. Once we eat that plant, that plant becomes a part of us, and then we can give back to the plant by our actions and the way that we treat the earth and the way that we. So, mm. yeah, sometimes recognizing that the energy from the plant is going to energize me to contribute or make a difference, or yeah, so yeah, yeah how can we give and that idea of contribution and generosity? as well giving first yeah or yeah. giving without expectation of return to yeah 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 so maybe that's where we can um potentially leave off with today is just maybe mm. people can leave this considering how could you give before you take mm. how can we reframe our mindset to to each other and to the natural world mm -hmm. absolutely yeah definitely yeah Okay, well, let's a, leave it at that then. Uh, oh. yeah, it's been a lovely Earth Day storytelling live stream. It's been yeah. a, one of our longer ones, but I feel like it was nice to have the space to share all those those wonderful stories and have that discussion. And thank you to everyone who's been who's been uh, leaving comments. It's been great to have a, a virtual conversation with you that way. And yeah. to anyone who watches this later, um, please feel free to keep the comments going. I'm I'm still monitoring the comments, and we can still respond and engage that way, even if you're not watching it live. So. Anything yeah. else? Final thoughts, Danny, Chris? Just thank you all for stopping by again. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much yeah. for taking out, you know, an hour and a quarter of your day to come yeah. sit and listen to us tell your stories. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah thank you, everyone. Mm. See you. See you next week. Yeah. See you all. Bye.